Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at skeletal muscle hypertrophy. Now we all know that going into the gym, lifting weights, undergoing resistance training increases our muscle mass, muscle volume, muscle size, and muscle cross-sectional area, all of which we term skeletal muscle hypertrophy. But the question is, how does this occur? So in this video, I'm gonna go through the mechanisms that promote skeletal muscle hypertrophy. But the first thing we need to go through is the skeletal muscle itself. So let's just say we have a whole muscle like a bicep, for example. Now, we know that this whole muscle is surrounded by connective tissue that we term fascia. And if we have a look inside of that whole muscle, you'll find that there's these discrete areas called fascicles. They themselves are surrounded by connective tissue, which we call perimyceum. Now you can see within each fascicle, are gonna, we're gonna have skeletal muscle cells, known as muscle fibers. And you can see these fibers. Now if I were to take one of these fascicles and pull out one of these muscle fibers, which we call a muscle cell, you're gonna see a couple of things. Firstly, it's surrounded by connective tissue as well. So the whole muscle, connective tissue, right? The fascicle, connective tissue, and then the muscle fiber, connective tissue. Now this is called the endomycium, that connective tissue around the muscle fiber. And underneath that, you've got the cell membrane, because all cells have a cell membrane, and we call this for muscle cells, the sarcolemma, all right? Now you can see that I've drawn up a couple of things. First of which, these little blue things here are called satellite cells. They're gonna be very important when it comes to hypertrophy. Satellite cells are sitting between the sarcolemma, so the cell membrane, and the connective tissue, the basal lamina. Okay, and they're sitting there and they're quiescent, which means they're asleep and they're waiting to be stimulated and do something very specific in order for skeletal muscle hypertrophy to occur. The other thing you can see is the nuclei of skeletal muscle. They have more than one. And again, this is important when it comes to satellite cells. Remember, the nucleus is where DNA is transcribed. We make more DNA. Now remember, proteins come from amino acids, which come from DNA. That's important. You can also see that if we were to take out one muscle fiber, that inside they're filled, they're really filled up with these things called myofibrils, these tubes. Now these myofibrils are made up of proteins. Two major types of proteins, there's more, but two major types you need to know called actin and myosin. Now what you're gonna find is that these proteins inside the myofibrils, they're contractile proteins. Because not all proteins are contractile, right? But these are contractile proteins. Now you'll see that dispersed between the myofibrils, we have some organelles, some subcellular components, things like mitochondria, right? Mitochondria is important for producing ATP, energy, which we need for skeletal muscle contraction. We also have things like sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the endoplasmic reticulum, but for skeletal muscle. And their important role is that they are the storage unit for calcium. We also need calcium for muscle contraction. In actual fact, calcium and ATP are two of the major things that we need for muscle contraction. There's other organelles as well, but let's just focus on those two. All right, now let's take a myofibril out. Have a look at this, right? We've got the myofibril sitting within the muscle fiber, sitting within the fascicle, sitting within the whole muscle. Each component is surrounded by connective tissue. We take a myofibril out and we looked at, look at the actin and myosin, contractile proteins within, and you'll see they have a particular arrangement. What I've drawn up here is something called a sarcomere. Now you keep hearing this word sarco as a prefix when we talk about skeletal muscle because it means flesh. All right, so you can see the two major types, actin, which we call the thin filament, and myosin that we call the thick filament. Now in order for muscle to contract, muscle, its job is to contract so that force can be generated, usually things can move. And you got cardiac muscle to pump blood, smooth muscle to push things through the hollow insides of, those, of that lumen, and we've got skeletal muscle attached to the skeleton so things can move, right? So, what we need to do is that this thick myosin filament needs to bind to the thin actin filament and these little myosin heads need to walk their way along the actin filament and it pulls it in. What this does is it shortens the skeletal muscle. In actual fact, it shortens this thing called the sarcomere. Now you're gonna have sarcomeres lined up in series like this or, or I should say, and lined up in parallel. Okay, and this is gonna be important when it comes to skeletal muscle hypertrophy as well. Now remember, 
The myosin can't bind to the actin unless calcium is present. Calcium frees the actin so it can bind, and calcium sits within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we need ATP. The thing with ATP is we don't actually have a lot of it just freely floating around. You think we would, but we don't. We need to generate ATP, and so skeletal muscle needs to generate ATP fast, and we'll talk about that with skeletal muscle hypertrophy soon. All right. Couple things. Now, when we talk about hypertrophy, I told you increasing the size, increasing the volume, increasing the mass, increasing the cross-sectional area. What do you think is increasing here? Is it the whole muscle? Is it the fascicle? Is it the muscle fiber? Or is it the sarcomere? Or is it the protein subunits of the sarcomere? Well, it's not just these individual things. So for example, a lot of people rely on skeletal muscle hypertrophy as just being an abundance of the proteins, the contractile proteins, and their arrangement within the sarcomere. People think that skeletal muscle hypertrophy is only more sarcomeres lined up in series or lined up in parallel. But that's only one type of skeletal muscle hypertrophy, right, called myofibrillar hypertrophy. I think we should write this down, right? So you can have myofibrillar hypertrophy. And like I said, what that is, is an increase in the protein subunits for contraction and an increase in the amount of sarcomeres we have either in series or in parallel. But we know that up to 20% of the whole muscle is connective tissue, like I stated before, right? So you've got that fascia, you've got the perimyceum, you've got the endomyceum, you've got the epimyceum on the outside here. So up to 20% is connective tissue. So in connective tissue is dynamic. It doesn't just sit there. Connective tissue can grow and it can contribute to strength. So you can have connective tissue hypertrophy. Now the last or third type of hypertrophy that we need to talk about is hypertrophy of non-contractile subunits and non-connective tissue, which has to do with the stuff sitting between the cells and in the cells, for example, which includes things like the organelles and the fluid, and also the metabolic energy sources that are stored inside of these muscle cells. So, for example, now we call this, let's just write this down, we call this sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, So what we're referring to for sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is an increase in the size or abundance or volume of the organelle. So it could be the mitochondria, it could be the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it could be the T-tubules that skeletal muscle needs to propagate that action potential to tell it to contract, right? It could be an accumulation of fluid inside and it could, could be an accumulation of the metabolic products needed to produce energy. So up to 3% of skeletal muscle is made up of glycogen. Up to 5% is made up of triglycerides. So you can increase the abundance of these and they're gonna come back later when we talk about hypertrophy. So these are the three major types. Now the thing is, what causes these types of hypertrophy? So Dr. Schoenfeld, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld is the king of skeletal muscle hypertrophy and all the research that I've performed, most of it has come from Dr. Schoenfeld. And so what Dr. Schoenfeld states as the three major causes or stimuli for hypertrophy include the following. Mechanical tension. Metabolic stress. And muscle damage. So these three stimuli are what can result in these three types of hypertrophy. Now your question may be, well, which of these hypertrophies occurring? Usually all of them are gonna be occurring to some degree. You're probably gonna think with resistance training, probably the most common type of hypertrophy is myofibrillar hypertrophy. But in saying that, when you look at bodybuilders and compare them to powerlifters, their training regime is different, but both of them exhibit quite significant musculature, quite significant muscle growth. And they train differently, right? So for example, bodybuilders have a moderate load with shorter rest periods, and you're gonna find that powerlifters have a higher load with longer 
rest periods. And what you might find is that some bodybuilders may more so have a connective tissue based and sarcoplasmic based hypertrophy because they tend to have more stores of glycogen within their cells and they tend to have more connective tissue products as well compared to the powerlifters. So training type can be specific to the type of hypertrophy that you get. All right. So mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. Of these, mechanical, mechanical tension is king, right? And you'll find that metabolic stress and muscle damage are additive to this process because you rarely get skeletal muscle hypertrophy on metabolic stress alone and muscle damage alone. Now let's talk about some things. Let's talk about how this can result in this. All right, so when you've got mechanical tension on a muscle, so you're lifting a particular load over time. And so we know that we have eccentric portions of a movement and concentric portions. Now in the eccentric portions where you've got lengthening of the muscle, but these sarcomeres are contracting, you can have damage occurring to the myofibrillar units. Now, damage promotes some form of inflammatory response. It can recruit cytokines and inflammatory cells, and this promotes repair, that's great. What also happens is this type of damage wakes up the sleeping satellite cells, the quiescent satellite cells, and they are myogenic cells. That means they're basically muscle stem cells. And what they can do is they fuse, since they're sitting underneath the basal lamina, right? But above the sarcolemma, they fuse with the muscle cell. They're all muscle cells, remember. They fuse with them and they donate a nuclei. That's why we've got more nuclear here. Donates a nuclei, and what that means is there's now more nuclei, more DNA, more transcriptional activity, more amino acids and proteins being produced. In actual fact, when you look at skeletal muscle, the larger the muscle is correlated with more nuclei. And this has to do with that satellite cell. So the satellite cell is really important for donating the nuclei. But in addition, the satellite cell can call upon particular transcriptional activities, right, since it's got this additional nuclei, transcribe more um, pathways associated with anabolic or growth pathways. So for example, mTOR, uh, MAP kinase, calcium signaling pathways, all of these can be recruited pathways for growth, anabolism. All right, so we we'll have focused on that. Now, when you look at the eccentric and you start to go into that pattern of movement, eccentric stretching at the same time that it's contracting, you can find that in some studies, animal studies predominantly, that the types of growth that you get at the sarcomere is an addition of sarcomeres in series. And when you get more concentric movements, the addition of sarcomeres is in parallel. All right, so again, the type of that movement can change what type of hypertrophy you have at the sarcomere. So talking about the myofibrillar hypertrophy. If we actually take all the, all the proteins within a skeletal muscle, what you're gonna find is up to 70% of them are myofibrillar proteins right, 70%. 20% of them are sarcoplasmic proteins and around about 10% are mitochondrial proteins. All right, now, a couple of other things is when, so if we have a look at different types of uh, load, so when we look at load, lifting load, it's usually gonna be represented as a percentage of our one RM and we usually equate that to how many reps we can perform of a particular weight, all right? So you can have a low rep scheme, a moderate rep scheme, and a high rep scheme. All right, low rep scheme, zero to six reps, moderate six to 12 reps, anything above 12, 13, 14, 15 reps and above is gonna be a high rep scheme. So what they've found is that the low to moderate rep scheme seems to be more beneficial to hypertrophy compared to high rep schemes. And the reason is a little bit complex, but has to do with a couple of things. Has to do with mechanical tension and has to do with metabolic stress and muscle damage. But let's look at metabolic stress now. So when you lift a particular load, we need ATP. And I told you that ATP is needed for muscle contraction. And I told you we don't have many reserves of ATP. So we need to produce it. Now, when we need to produce it immediately, we use something called the phosphocreatine pathway. Creatine likes to hold onto phosphate, called phosphocreatine, and it donates that phosphate to an ADP to basically turn it into ATP, we have energy. But that only lasts for like one to three seconds, not very long at all. So the low rep scheme tends to favor the phosphocreatine pathway. When we go into the moderate rep scheme, right, six to 12 reps, 
We go past that and we start to go into glycolysis. We start to use glucose for energy. Now, if we're doing this quick and fast, and remember, when you have glycolysis and it jumps into the mitochondria, it uses oxygen to produce heaps of ATP. If we need more ATP than we have available oxygen, it has to go through another pathway, which is producing lactate, right? And ATP as well. Now, the thing is, lactate production is associated with hypertrophy in this sense. Lactate can pull water, has a strong osmotic gradient, right? It pulls water into the cell and causes the muscle cell to swell. This swelling of the muscle cell puts pressure on the sarcolemma, so the cell membrane, and this actually stimulates a couple of things. It stimulates amino acid transport and it stimulates anabolism or protein synthesis. Brilliant. So this is something that, um, lactate can do. Lactate production is also associated with testosterone levels and growth hormone levels as well. All right. So it seems to be, this is why the moderate rep scheme seems to be represented as potentially the most beneficial when it comes to hypertrophy. But let's not forget volume. All right. So that's load. Volume is adding up all your reps and sets in a single session. And it seems to be the higher the volume, the better it is for hypertrophy as well. Now, let's talk about something that involves both metabolic stress and muscle damage, which is hypoxia. So hypoxia is a reduction in oxygen going to that tissue and feeding that tissue. So often we call this vascular occlusion, and there's some, sort, there's some types of training where you occlude the vasculature with a cuff, for example. And it seems to be that this type of hypoxic or, or banded vascular occlusion training can increase muscle hypertrophy if done in accordance with exercise, and it doesn't even need to be under high load. So what they've found is that hypoxia training or vascular occlusion training, without any exercise, just the vascular occlusion, can maintain muscle size and strength for individuals who are bedridden. If you mix it in with exercise, there seems to be an additive effects with hypoxia and exercise to promote hypertrophy as well. So that's really interesting. Why? Why does this hypoxic event promote hypertrophy? Couple of theories. One of which is that of lactate. So when you've got no oxygen, we're forced to use uh, glucose to produce ATP and lactate. And like I said, lactate pulls water into the cell, it swells, promotes amino acids and protein synthesis, and also promotes uh, growth hormone and testosterone coming in. The other thing is when you have a hypoxic environment, low oxygen, you get the production of reactive oxygen species, one of which is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide tells blood vessels to dilate. So after that training, when you release the cuff or the band, you get increased in nitric oxide, tells blood vessels to dilate, you get hyperemia, which is more blood to that area, carrying all the metabolites that you require for growth. So maybe that is also another factor coming into play. So what I've gone through here, is the anatomy of the skeletal muscle and gone through the different types of hypertrophy and also the different causes of these particular hypertrophic uh, uh, events. Hopefully that helps and makes sense.